When the Greens' new Prince Regent Amon suggested an alliance with the Triarchy of the Free Cities, everyone balked at the idea. Yet here, the master of ships Thailand Lannister is in Essos, having traveled there to negotiate said partnership on the Crown's behalf. Things aren't going all that well, especially when the leaders of the Triarchy want the one thing Thailand can't promise them, gold. Breaking the blockade that Corley's Valerian's ships are currently enforcing would only benefit everyone, Thailand insists, but the Triarchy won't budge. Since there's no real incentive for them to assist in this fight, not until one of them suggests they be given control of the Stepstones as payment. Besides, all the Triarchy promises to do is enforce an itty-bitty tax on anyone who happens to be passing through that island chain. Thailand may be making a decision he'll regret by agreeing to hand over the Stepstones in exchange for the Triarchy's armada of ships, but these pirates, as the master of ships scornfully labels them, are pretty good negotiators. Before Thailand can return to Westeros with his new fleet, however, he has to meet the approval of their commander, Admiral Lohar, and is more than taken aback by the revelation that said Admiral, emerging from the back corner of the room, happens to be a woman. Lohar gives him an appraising look before issuing a challenge of her own. She won't sail with a man who can't beat her in some good old-fashioned mud wrestling. It's about as sloppy and undignified and distanced from Westeros as Thailand has ever been, and initially it looks like Lohar is going to win handily. Until the master of ships gets in a good punch or two which is apparently enough to make Lohar reconsider her opinion of him being a soft noble. She'll lead her fleet of ships into battle on the Green's behalf, but first, she has one more request for Thailand at the feast later that night, impregnate all of her wives first. Back in Westeros, Amon taken Vogger to Sharp Point and immolated the entire town, people and all. It's one of the most disturbing decisions Amon's ever made. But it proves particularly alarming to King's Landing's Master of Whisperers, Larry Strong, who immediately seeks an audience with a still-recovering Aegon to inform him of the news. Larry's also voices a suggestion of his own to the king, flee the city now while Amon is gone, because there's no telling what he might be capable of once he returns, including picking up where he left off at Rook's rest and delivering the killing blow. Aegon's first instinct is to resist rather than run and have Amon thrown in prison by the time his brother comes back. But that doesn't mean he'll be any more prepared to face Rhaenyra and her seven dragons with Vagar out of the picture. It's here that we learn Aegon's dragon, Sunfire, didn't survive the battle at Rook's Rest, and Aegon himself is so disfigured that certain parts no longer work the way they used to. Yet Larry's appeals to the part of Aegon that wants to be beloved spinning a story of someone who can return once his enemy's forces are too exhausted to go on, and be hailed by his people as a king risen from the ashes. The next time we see Aegon in this episode, he's taken Larry's counsel to heart, fleeing King's Landing alongside his Master of Whisperers in a covered wagon while others ready themselves for battle. The possibility of flight over fight is also being weighed by Alicent who, having returned to the city from her extended nature walk, is thinking over the best way to ensure her and her daughter's safety. Such an absence won't go unnoticed, especially because Amond is already seeking out his sister, intending to convince her to join the battle with her dragon, Dreamfire. But Helena is not the dragon rider her brothers are, as Rhaenyra has astutely noted already, and Amon's desperate attempt to recruit her is met with refusal not only from Helena, but Alicent, who has finally reached the threshold of how much she's willing to bear from her youngest son. If anyone can see the extent to which Amon's recent actions have been defined by his unchecked fury, it's Alicent, but she refuses to let his basest instincts corrupt his sister in the process. Amon leaves the room without securing a second dragon for his cause, and Alicent immediately seeks her own assistance, from Grand Maester Orwile, in the hopes of securing passage to parts unknown to us. On the road to Harrenhal, Sir Criston Cole has reached his emotional crisis point, confronted by Alicent's brother Gwen for having one of the Dowager Queen's handkerchiefs in his possession. Criston doesn't defend his actions or lie about their affair, but what gets Gwen to ultimately lower his sword is Criston's admission that he considers Alicent his savior in more ways than one. It's clear that the events of Rook's rest have left a mark on the Lord Commander that's beyond repair, one that's led him to some personal reflection about the corruption of men and whether honor may actually be a myth, 
Kristen admits he once believed himself to be a defender of the righteous, dispensing justice on everyone else, but witnessing the deaths of hundreds, maybe even thousands. To the punishing spread of Dragonfire has changed his perspective. The dragons dance, and men are like dust under their feet. At this stage, Kristen muses, dying may very well be more of a relief than anything else. It's an observation that leaves Gwen himself too stunned to reply at all. Helena had been the one to readily identify her younger brother as the one responsible for Aegon's debilitating injuries before, courtesy of her visions. And it's already been pointed out multiple times that she has no taste for burning anyone. However, Aemon's quiet appeal is more pleading now. And there's even a tear in the Prince Regent's eye, though whether it's from rage or vulnerability is unclear. When Helena brings up Aemon's role in Aegon's trauma again, she also issues what seems to be a prophecy of her own. Aegon will be king again, he's yet to see victory. He sits on a wooden throne and you, you'll be dead. You were swallowed up in the god's eye and you were never seen again. When Aemon threatens to have Helena killed for her words, the queen remains resolute, pointing out that her death wouldn't change the course of the events she's seen. At Dragonstone, Rhaenyra's brand new dragon riders are proving a bitter pill to swallow for Jackeries, who's instantly turned off by Ulf the White's poor manners. The man's even got his feet up on the painted table of all places. By contrast, Hugh the Hammer attempts to make amends for his compatriot's behavior, pointing out that Ulf doesn't know how to act around nobility because he's never had any experience at court. But Ulf is also single-handedly voicing many of Jace's worst fears by pointing out that they're both dragon riders now cut from the same cloth. Given that exchange between Jace and his mother last week, and the prince's lingering concerns about whether any of these new additions to their cause could challenge for the throne some day, there's no love lost between Jace and any of these men, even if they have their own dragons now. When Bela finds him sulking later, she issues a stern pep talk that seems to work. Get up and take your place by your mother's side. It's a conversation that couldn't have happened a moment too soon. As Rhaenyra reveals her plan of attack to her dragon riders over dinner that night, they must ride in two days' time to subdue the cities and armies of Old Town and Lannisport, which means a crash course in learning Valyrian commands and being fitted with armor. Meanwhile, at Harrenhal, Rhaenyra's emissary from the small council, Sir Alfred Broom, has finally arrived to Shadow Demon. The king consort seems less than pleased to have a babysitter following him around, but once the two men are in private in the godswood, Sir Alfred offers to shift his loyalties to Demon and back his claim to the crown instead. Admit Admittedly, the demon of only a few weeks ago would have greedily snatched up another bannerman. But the demon who regards Sir Alfred now is confident in calling him out as a turn cloak, rejecting the implication that he should serve as the King Westeros needs. Their conversation doesn't go unnoticed by Harrenhal's Castellan, Sir Simon Strong, who hastily sends off a raven to Rhaenyra, expressing his concerns about subterfuge and betrayal. Whatever the contents of the letter are, they're worrisome enough that Rhaenyra instantly saddles up Cyrax and flies to Harrenhal alongside Adam and Seasmoke to discover, once and for all, what Demon's true intentions are. Before Rhaenyra reaches Harrenhal, however, Demon has his biggest vision of all, and it comes courtesy of accompanying Ali's rivers to the godswood in the dead of night. Touching the heart tree, which is already leaking a red sap that bears a disturbing resemblance to blood, plunges him into a waking dream of the future that completely changes his perspective on events. Not only do we, alongside Demon, witness glimpses of what the Dance of the Dragons may culminate in, but we see other significant figures including the Night King beyond the wall, and a young Daenerys Targaryen surrounded by her three newly hatched dragons from the season one finale of Game of Thrones. It's a sequence that immediately gives Demon new context for his previous arguments with Rhaenyra about the Song of Ice and Fire prophecy, but also seems to change him for the better. When he first arrived at Harrenhal, as Alice observes, he was a closed fist who wished to bend the world to his will. Now, Demon's willingness to submit himself to these glimpses of past, present and future has given him an even deeper insight into the future than Rhaenyra could claim, and he finally envisions his wife atop the Iron Throne rather than Viserys or himself. Thus, when Rhaenyra descends on Harrenhal, Sir Simon Strong is there to meet her, ushering the queen in to see Demon at once. As the two spouses come face to face for the first time since Demon left Dragonstone, the mood is tense, to say the least. And it doesn't lighten even when they slip into their old habit of speaking to each other, in High Valyrian. But Demon insists that he understands what's truly coming, the winter beyond the war itself, and who will be called to lead them, therefore, in front of all the men he has won to their side. Demon bends the knee to Rhaenyra, 
a move that is possibly the hottest thing he has done in this series to date, along with a promise of loyalty. I am meant to serve you, and all of these with me. Until death or the end of our story, this increase in forces does bode well for Rhaenyra's ability to take back her throne. But it also weighs heavily on the queen when she reflects privately on what must transpire once back at Dragonstone with Mysaria. Even if she prevails and returns the realm to peace, who will pay the ultimate price in the end? Alicent met Rhaenyra and asserts her own plan to flee with Helena and Jahera. Rhaenyra points out that history may not remember her kindly. She'll be labeled a villain, a cold queen, grasping for power and then defeated. Alicent doesn't care what anyone thinks of her after this, now that she's finally choosing for herself. But she makes one last plea of her own, echoing Aemon's earlier in the episode, inviting Rhaenyra to come with her. The Black Queen refuses, acknowledging that her part in all of this was decided for her long ago as she bids Alicent to leave and it feels an awful lot like these two women, who once deeply loved each other, are parting ways for good. As Rhaenyra's dragon riders begin suiting up for battle, we follow each of the major players' progression on the board. Tylan, Lohar, and the Triarchy advancing from Essos, while Kristen, Gwen, and Prince Darren on his dragon Tessarion, plus their men, continue their trek to Harrenhal.